Yeah, and just make some checks. Uh, can you speak so we check the audio? Speak. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, super, super. Be here and well, so we'll start uh, in a minute. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon to the audience joining us online. I would like to welcome you to this afternoon session. I hope everybody had an amazing lunch. <laughs> I was happy to see everyone is awake now, so I think we're really ready for this panel before us today. Um, firstly, I would like to introduce the panel to you for this session today on rising authoritarian rule and conflicts, how to turn the tide. Really a key question right now in the continent, especially um, given the relations with the the war in Ukraine, as well as the changing geopolitical landscape. Be before me today, I have a very illustrious panel, all gentlemen, so I'm really feeling uh, lovely to be amongst them. But of course, we'll be joined uh, by Madame Rita Lahunginia, who will be joining us online as well today. So I will just start with introductions of the gentlemen before me today. To my left <laughs> is Mr. George Van Montfort. He's currently the Deputy Director of the UN or UNDP office here in Brussels, as well as a representative of the, of the UN to the EU. Prior to joining this office, he served as UNDP resident in Zimbabwe. Right next to him is Mr. Ola Bello. Ola is the Executive Direct, Director of Good Governance Africa based in Nigeria. He has extensive experience in research and policy ad advice, advising on governance and executive reform together with um, issues around development and international cooperation. And next to him, needs no introduction, is Mr. Paul Simon Handy, who is the Regional Director, East Africa, and also to the AU. Before that, he was the Regional Expert at the UN, based uh, working as the Security Council in the Central African Republic. And he's also well-researched and written extensively on issues of peace and security. And then last and not least, we have Madame Rita Lahunginia. Thank you for joining us. She is the director of the Africa Department at the European External Action Service. Prior to this, she was ambassador to Portugal and to Denmark and Lithuania, and has also served as head of office and deputy director in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Portugal. You're welcome. So as you can see today, we have really um, experts covering all aspects. We have representation from the UN, the EU, civil, civil society in Africa, but also ISS who works closely with the African Union. So I want to thank you all for being here. And I'm hoping that you're all ready and energized to really engage in these discussions. We want to keep it as uh, interactive as possible uh, to be able to have also audience participation. So what I'm going to do first is to keep it um, quite slight in the beginning, just to you know, tease out some of your perspectives on this topic. As you know, at the moment, uh, we have been seeing a lot of discussions on peace and security. Europe and Africa are themselves facing a series of you know, crises within themselves. Uh, but as we know from this, that peace and security has been one of the most effective partnerships of the AU-AU partnership, or some have argued, compared to, for example, migration and others. Uh, which stem from uh, different perspectives. How can these different interests and new geopolitical realities be reckoned with and leveraged to continue the EU-AU partnership? I would like to start first of all with George. Maybe in your intervention, you can also give us a perspective from the UN, because let's be honest, the UN Security Council has the primacy responsibility for peace and security worldwide. How can you Oh, how, in your opinion, do you see these new global realities affecting the EU-AU partnership, but also the EU-AU-UN partnership, which is quite key? Thank you. Thank you so much. This, this. Oh. Yes? Okay. Um, no, so, and thank you. Thank you so much. And, and I must be honest, I'm, I'm replacing Jida, who would be much more eloquent than I can be in, in this. But so uh, my apologies if, if I disappoint in this panel. Um, but for, for one, I think I want to, when we were reflecting on this, our first thought was this is not about Africa necessarily. I mean, the world is facing these crises. The world is facing the fact that people are losing trust in, in their governments, uh, polarization, misinformation. 
it may not always translate into to violent resurgence or, or, or coups, but we do see that this is a common threat across the world, that we are sort of this intermix of crises, the, the debt overhang that we're seeing, which led in Sri Lanka to, the, to a full change of government. Um, and if we look at the debt situation, just at that crisis, 54 countries in the world are very likely to, uh, to not be able to repay their debt. And that will then trigger public expenditure crisis and all of that on top of what we've seen with COVID, uh, on top of what we've seen with the climate crisis, et cetera. So I think, I think when we look at it, as you said, it's a geopolitical challenge. It's a polarization within countries and, and to a certain extent also polarization between countries. Um, and we've had many discussions with our EU colleagues as well on, on how to read those famous tea leaves when we look at the for example the voting pattern that you see in the general assembly on things like ukraine where for some it was a surprise that some african countries withheld or or abstained their vote but when you talk to to the governments of those countries you understand why it's the case and it's it's a it's that broader picture of of not wanting to be drawn into one or two of the sides or, or three or four of the sides but really to foc to the need to focus on development in your own country and, and to have that, that freedom of moving. Um, it's a concern, as I said, for us, because human development for the first time in, in, since history that we started tracking it is actually falling back. Uh, two years in a row, we've seen a general decline in human development, whilst we've seen over the past 28 years in growth. And so we're back to 2016. And so we're back to the start of the SDGs in a way. Right, so we've lost, it's 2022 now, almost 23, we've lost all that ground. And I think we mustn't forget how important that is, even though the topic is peace and security, but how important those underlying development challenges are for the people that we serve and the people we work with in countries. <clears throat> and I think that's also where, beyond sort of the three topics that we can delve into a little bit more detail in, in the, in the follow-up discussions, we are looking at how do we respond together with the AU and the EU on some of those complex uh, political transitions that we see in a in number of African countries. We are looking at PVE, so the prevention of violent extremism, which again we're seeing in, in a number of areas coming up and in places where a few years ago we wouldn't talk about it. I mean, let's, let's look at Tanzania. Right? I just served in Zimbabwe and we had issues on the border, things that a few years ago we wouldn't imagine, but, but now it's real. So we can talk a little bit about how we, how we work on that. And then the third element, which is sort of the broader peace and security discussions and the discussion on how do we support elections and, and those conflict transitions. So I'm happy to go into those details maybe in a little bit, but I did want to paint a bigger picture of almost a crisis in development, if you wish, that, that, it, that faces all our countries and that fuels some of these underlying tensions. Thank you so much, George. I mean, clearly, you know, spelling out crisis in development, which I think we're still yet to see, you know, the developments both on the African and the EU side, and this, but also with the UN, the role that it plays, you know, as, as a peace security actor. Maybe just to complement this, I would like to bring in Rita at this moment, you know, because we have had discussions, uh, even yesterday's high panel, really hitting on this issue of, of the, the war in Ukraine and how it, it's uh, the perceptions of support that was expected from some of the, the African sides. Maybe uh, to use the words that were quoted, uh, not taking it for granted that the support would be given as expected. What for you really in this new uh, geopolitical realities, how do you see this affecting the EU and AU partnership, especially in peace and security, which you have been doing for a long time? Can you share with us some of your perspectives on this? Thank you. Well, thank you very much and uh, sorry that I'm not joining you physically. It seems a bit ridiculous that, you know, that I'm in Brussels and not there with you, but, um, but it's been a very busy week and I'm, I'm, I'm traveling to South Africa uh, in the next few days and then I have a meeting just starting at 3 o'clock. So it was uh, really difficult to, to be there with you uh, physically and, uh, and thank you for the invitation. Of course, what, um. It's uh, indeed, well, uh, I think that's what uh, is uh, in everybody's minds uh, these days. It's uh, the, the war uh, in, uh, of aggression in, uh, of Russia in, in Ukraine, and of course the impact that it's, it has uh, worldwide and, uh, and the impact it has uh, um, seen from my perspective here from MD Africa, of course, the impact that it has uh, in the relations with, uh, with African uh, partners. And we cannot, uh, uh, of course, um, hide that it does have an impact since 
since uh, um, African economies, African countries are suffering um, severely the effects of uh, of the spike in the energy prices and uh, in uh, food uh, um, prices. Um, but as we are concentrating on uh, on issues relating to peace, uh, security, and governance, and I think that. Uh, uh, probably my uh, most useful contribution and more interesting for, for you at this point would be to share with you the um, um, overall the, um, the discussions that we ha had uh, this Monday um, in the margins of the um, uh, commission to commission meeting that uh, took place here in uh, Brussels. Uh, we held um, the European Union with and the African Union uh, the first uh, senior officials meeting under uh, an MOU um, on peace, security and governance that had been signed in 2018. And that's still also because of COVID. In the meantime, had still not uh, been uh, put into practice. And, and I think this, just the fact that the meeting took place is, is a first sign of uh, how um, active the, the partnership uh, still is. And of course, the fact that this commission to commission took place also this uh, Monday um, is that despite uh, the, the challenges that, uh, um, that we are facing worldwide, we are indeed uh, continuing to put a lot of emphasis uh, on this partnership and a lot of energy on finding ways to work uh, better uh, together with uh, our African partners. And we discussed um, uh, issues uh, relating to governance. Uh, uh, we discussed issues relating, and of course, we we took um, uh, we we decided to work uh, more specifically or or to exchange uh, more in depth on issues relating to the civil society engagement, to the uh, the electoral processes, not only the electoral observation, but the, the support to the all, all overall electoral process the, throughout the electoral cycle. Uh, we spoke a lot, of course, about the importance to exchange more uh, with our African partners on uh, countering disinformation. Um, we um, were having this meeting in the follow-up of um, a seminar uh, between the EU and the African Union, the first one uh, on conflict prevention and peace mediation. And uh, it was uh, again uh, uh, underlined how relevant it is that we um, work together um, before the, the cycles of, of uh, violence uh, um, develop. And so uh, a lot of emphasis was put on conflict prevention, peace mediation, and that this has been uh, one of the main objectives uh, of uh, Commissioner Bancole since he took uh, office as uh, the commissioner in charge for peace, uh, security, and political affairs, as you may know. So we will um, work um, on, on uh, comparing notes on, uh, on our um, instruments that we have that the European Union and the African Union and see how we can better um, uh, coordinate efforts and better exchange pra practices. And we also uh, spoke about the importance of engaging uh, more um, in a trilateral cooperation with the UN. Um, and of course, we will continue to, to work very closely because that is the, the logic of the, the African peace security architecture uh, very closely also with the regional economic communities. Um, then, uh, um, well, of course, uh, um, we also spoke about very concrete uh, uh, cooperation that we have uh, in security and defense uh, matters with uh, uh, the African Union. We know that the EU is a, a strong supporter of African Union peace support operations, um, and we uh, spoke uh, more in depth about uh, uh, Somalia, about the Lake uh, Chad. Uh, but we also spoke uh, uh, about the um, how um, the experiences that have already been uh, developed of support uh, through the new uh, European Peace uh, Facility. So that is another uh, area that was um, that was touched uh, upon. Um, Last, um, we also looked into um, new areas of uh, cooperation where we have uh, to, to, to exchange uh, more because we see that there are essentials, uh, essential uh, aspects of, uh, of um, the, um, ensuring uh, peace and, uh, and security. And so we will, um, we will be uh, analyzing the possibilities of working more together on uh, cybersecurity matters. Um, to uh, also develop cooperation in what regards to counterterrorism and uh, countering violent extremism and uh, more emphasis
emphasis on uh, the exchanges of, uh, of practices and uh, cooperation on issues relating to uh, to the to DDR to disarmament immobilization and reintegration so overall so that you see that um, well there's a, a huge scope of, of cooperation between the EU and the African Union and uh, and I think that the global context uh, and the global challenges only um, um, give us the uh, motivation and the reasons and energy to uh, continue to to concentrate a lot on um, on doing a better um, on working better together uh, with the African Union being more effective in in the fight of uh, of all these uh, threats that uh, that are still um, of course uh, well undermining the development of of the African continent to close uh, uh, going back and and of course uh, supporting what uh, George was uh, uh, just uh, saying that uh, these uh, um, that the, the underlying um, reasons for um, for these uh, uh, security threats in Africa, of course, uh, often come from uh, from the challenges that that still exist in uh, in terms of uh, the development of the different countries and regions in Africa. Over to you. Thank you so much, um, Rita, for for sharing this perspective. And I think you really touched on one key aspect that I want to bring into the conversation, which is governance. You know, and I, I look to Ola <laughs> to really uh, share your insights on this. Some interlocutors have actually commented that the EU's approach has been significantly militarized. You know, support has mostly gone to peace, peace support operations, whereas some of the structural um, issues uh, that, 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 that fuel violence and terrorism, you know, poverty, um, issues around social services, climate change, have not been given sufficient attention within the peace and security uh, agenda. So Ola, working on good governance uh, in, in Africa. What, in your opinion, have been some of the shortcomings in the way support has been given towards governance? And what do you see as the points that really need to be, you know, focused on to, 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 to not only deal with conflict prevention, early prevention, but also post-conflict reconstruction development, which I haven't heard being mentioned, which is quite key for countries emerging from conflict. Good governance, rule of law needs to, to be reintroduced to ensure we don't fall back into the cycle. Please share with us some of your perspectives. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, Philomena. Um, <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be back here um, in Brussels um, and, you know, a city I worked in um, for an extensive um, period, more than 12 years ago now, on issues around EU-Africa relations. Um, as some of you know me well, would, um, would attest, um, it's one that um, I'm often very reluctant to come and talk about these days, um, if not for anything, um, because of the huge potential that I think a lot of us um, acknowledge in EU and Africa working together in a way that's more coherent um, and driven um, a broader, uh, much more strategic vision. Um, but the truth of the matter is um, this has not often been the case. Um, so on the question you've asked me, um, I think a lot's been said about Ukraine, um, you know, some of the way that's impacting everyone in Europe and Africa, um, the scarcity of everything, the horrific um, inflation that um, I think is affecting um, people on both continents. Um, before that, we had the challenge with, um, with COVID, which as you know, in Africa, um, wasn't really a health pandemic as such, but I'm of the view that um, some of its legacies um, continue to persist in a way that's real and that's um, affecting um, the daily lives um, of a lot of ordinary people. Um, I would put into that mix um, a third dimension that I think um, should be a challenge for, for Europe and Africa, but in the way we've often framed this thing, um, it, it seems that we're constantly speaking past them each other. And that's um, what I would, you know, regard as somebody sitting in Africa today, I've done for the last seven years, um, the 17 years before that, a lot of my training I'm done very much here on the European side. I think we face the spectacle um, of what you might call um, an authoritarian revanchism. Um, so you've seen coups um, in, in, in a lot of the West African neighborhood, um, something I think um, pushes back against this notion that 
we were on the road to somewhere um, that we were building a community of value, um, you know, unconditional change of government no longer acceptable. I'm not so sure today. Um, so um, I'm always looking for solutions. And I think um, whether one is talking about peace building, conflict resolution, and all of those things, there's a lot that you and Africa can do together and should be doing together. Um, and there, I think um, there needs to be a deeper understanding both in, in Europe and Africa that when Europeans um, and people within the so-called transatlantic community think about um, you know, the challenge posed by geostrategic rivals, it's something we also perceive in Africa in a different way. In the work that I do, people talk a lot about you know, uh, you know where you know where do you um where is your support um between the notions or models of effective governance and more inclusive forms of governance, um and I think this is um this is a false dichotomy. Um, I think both can cohere. Um, Africa needs both. The interesting thing for me is that when you ask a lot of people in Africa, you know, we talk about EU Africa partnership. It's something, as we know, that's um, carried on mostly at the governmental level. It would be good to um, get more voices involved in this. How you get it done, I think, has been the frustrating element that has not really moved along that much. But the good news is that um, a lot of people in Africa uh, may like um, roads built by Chinese, may like other things that are brought by other partners, but when you ask, ask them, um, the resounding feedback is that they like more responsive um, governance. And if this is what the European Union also wants, and I believe this is the, um, the aspiration, there is a lot we can do together here. I've had so much said about, you know, um, a more strategic approach. We're, we're tired. We want to focus on the lower hanging fruit. Some of the thematic issues you talked about, Philomena, I think those things must continue, but they will not deliver unless we go back to that original vision of a more strategic sort of engagement. I've turned the question around in my own mind a lot in the last time, um, few weeks, you know, to try and find historical parallels um, for where partners come together and they're supposedly trying to engage with each other in a more strategic way. The closest thing I've found to the EU-Africa relation, I would say, is transatlantic relation in the way that you might say America is the senior partner um, in this relationship. Also, America's relation with the Gulf Corporation Council countries um, to have um, um, a, an engagement that delivers the number of critical elements that are needed. For EU and Africa, some of these things exist but there is a lot of it that we now need to invent. And um, as we progress in this conversation, I would be happy to um, you know, put some of my, the more specific ideas I have in my own mind on the table as well. Thank you so much, Ola, for this really you know, hitting home the need for responsive governance. You know, People do want this, but how can it be best nurtured? How can support be given, not just from top down, you know, but from bottom up? I would like to bring in now Paul Simon. You've had all these different perspectives shared from the UN, from the EU, and also from um, somebody working really on governance and understanding this. Sitting at the ISS, also working closely with the African Union. How do you see some of these geopolitical realities shifting or influencing how African states are relating within the partnership, especially in peace and security? And to Yesterday's in yesterday's high panel, you did mention the challenge of making common African positions, you know, and we, we do know that it's quite key when you speak about participation in the global forum. Already we've had discussions at the UN level, you know, Africa calling for reforms of the of the, of the UN Security Council. How do you see what's happening now influencing, you know, some of the positioning around this? And do you see within the partnership space to have honest conversation about some of these issues? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So maybe before talking about the partnership as such, um, uh, I think George mentioned issues around um, complex political transitions. I would like maybe to come back to um, the point of analyze, analyzing the beast of what is Africa today, actually, 
the partner we are looking for. I think we need to look at, um, because I mean, we are here to discuss uh, rising author uh, authoritarianism and conflicts. Yes, I see the number and the intensity of conflict rising in Africa. It's true. Um, I mean, for several years, actually decades, we had a curve going down, but now it's actually going up. Um, but I don't see rising authoritarianism in Africa, actually. Um, and I'll say why. Um, because I think it's a very optimistic view of what we've seen recently. Um, African states are in transitions, and there are several transitions. But the African state, Africa, African countries are in a stage of state building, fragile state building. And I think when we, uh, we should never forget that when we talk about African international re relations. These are young states, 60 years of existence. It's, it's a footnote in the broader scheme of history. It's really peanuts. So these are young states, and what we see, the conflict, the violence, and so on, these are teething problems of young states, and we've seen them everywhere. So maybe coming back to the transitions I, uh, uh, I was mentioning, I see six transitions. A demographic one, which, um, and, and really I think these are structural matters we should be looking uh, at when we, we we talk about African state. There's a demographic transition. And um, um, when I say demographic transition, I'm not saying that the African population is massive, that Africa is overpopulated. Africa is actually underpopulated. I'm repeating, underpopulated, yeah? There might be spaces of overpopulation in Africa, but as a whole, the African continent is underpopulated, but is facing a massive, a pace of demographic boom that actually puts governments at a very difficult, in a very difficult place to manage. So African government struggle, African growth struggles to manage with the pace of demographic growth. But Africa still has space, yeah? Uh, we can accommodate uh, more people. So. The second, uh, the second important transition is an economic transition. Um, African straight states are not growing as fast as the, as I was saying, as the demography is growing, creating distortions in many ways. And I mean, we can come back to it. The third one, and this is uh, probably also what George was mentioning, uh, is a transition in terms of regime type. Um, African states, most African states are neither authoritarian nor fully democratic. They are in a space of in between, and that undefined phase creates a lot of um, upheavals, a lot of conflicts, a lot of violence. Um, and there is nothing that suggests that. The, the, the transition is moving towards democracy or uh, actually going back to autocracy. Uh, countries go back and forth. Uh, so um, there's no linear development towards democracy there. So, and then of course we have a, an important transition regarding horizontal inequalities that are actually uh rising with growth i mean the more the uh, the, the middle class is growing in certain countries the more inequalities are are are, are created so there's these uh, there's this issue and i think an important transition today is also the digital one the digital tran transition is quite key because it creates a new space that can actually generate a lot of positive growth but also is uh, an unknown space in which criminals are, are, are also um, creating havoc, basically, and where we also need a lot of uh, uh, regulatory fr frameworks. So having said that, then we, uh, we see the nature of the beast we're trying to uh, cooperate with. So how do you actually create common positions with countries that are young, fragile, 
going through multiple crises and having completely different needs. I mean, Nigeria's needs in terms of development are not Botswana's, yeah? So uh, Ethiopia is not Burkina Faso. So, uh, so we have several um, uh, uh, categories of countries and it's extremely difficult to create common positions uh, in, uh, uh, under such cir circumstances. So I, I just wanted to bring us back to these uh, uh, structural realities that we uh, should take into account uh, in discussing Europe and Africa's relations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul Simon, for that. Um, I think you really have elucidated some of the really key issues that we have to consider. You know, Africa itself is going through its own transition, and without understanding, as you call it, the nature of the beast, then our support may not necessarily meet the needs of the beast. <laughs> to put it like that. Um, but um, so I've heard all these points. I mean, for me, what comes to also mind within the partnership when we speak about it, we spoke about the geopolitical implications of it, but there are two other issues that still stick out for me that need to address, you know, one being financing. Uh, and we know that our financial challenges also affect the partnership, uh, although it's considered to be more effective than others. And concerns have arisen over, for example, the sustainability of uh, EU's financing for Africa peace and security architecture. And I'm glad that Madame Rita is here to you know, sort of answer some of the question because on the European side, we see that the introduction and current use of the European peace facility has raised many questions. And on the AU side, we see that the African uh, member states themselves have not been able to meet the target to have the, the peace fund fully endowed you know, so we, we still have this funding issue that is hanging and looming over the partnership. And then to add a third dimension is how to get UN support for Africa-led missions. And I think this is a debate that has been raised at the, at, the, at, the, at the UN and was shelved. So really, how can we, as we speak about this partnership going forward, deal with this issue of financing? I'd like to hear perspectives from all of you here. I will start maybe with the um, EU perspective because the European Peace Facility is, 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 is the main instrument that will be used. Um, so Rita, if you can please share some of your perspectives on some of these concerns. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, indeed, the, there's been a lot of, uh, of discuss, discussions and a lot of uh, concerns also that have been expressed because we have uh, transitioned uh, to, to use the, also the transitional concept uh, from the African peace uh, facility to the European peace uh, facility. And, uh, and of course, because um, uh, there is also uh, all these uh, uh, indications that um, a lot of the, um, the budget that uh, was allocated to, to the European Peace Facility is being used uh, uh, in support uh, of, uh, of Ukraine and uh, in support of the, the defense uh, of, uh, of Ukrainians. Um, the, the truth is that um, as we, uh, as this, uh, the, this transition was decided and the, 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 um, the, um, the establishment of the African uh, Peace uh, Facility was uh, was established. The idea was that uh, that it would um, uh, sorry that the European Peace Facility was established. The idea was never uh, that uh, we would uh, reduce uh, the um, the support uh, to to Africa. That is uh, why uh, we there are eighteen uh, um, common security and defense uh, policy missions uh, worldwide, and eleven of them uh, are in uh, in. Africa and and the last one was uh, uh, created uh, just uh, during the the last year in a, in a, a very um, well uh, in uh, in very quickly in very well uh, going into uh, or responding as uh, as efficiently as uh, as we hope uh, to uh, the um, supporting the the Mozambican armed uh, forces in the, the fight against uh, terrorism in the in the north of the country in the, in the Cap Delgado uh, province. So um, no, no, um, the, the focus has not moved away from uh, from Africa. Uh, on the contrary, uh, our missions are mainly uh, in Africa, and uh, there was even one last uh, uh, one mission, the last one uh, to be. Um, 
launched that was again a, a mission in Africa and responding uh, to the requests of uh, the country itself, uh, Mozambique, but also um, answering uh, to the requests of, uh, of the region. And uh, that is why we are also supporting uh, the uh, um, operation from the SADC uh, um, regional economic community, so SAMIM, and, uh, and the EU is also supporting this uh, regional effort. And um, and so the the focus is still on uh, peace uh, support on on operations in Africa. At the same time, uh, um, although well the the European uh, peace facility was established and there was no longer the African peace. Uh, uh, facility or fund, uh, we have uh, earmarked um, a very substantial um, very substantial amount of, of money to um, uh, our uh, cooperation with the, with the African Union. Um, and we are talking about 600 million euros. And uh, we have been uh, uh, supporting a number of uh, of operations, of course, decided together uh, with uh, with uh, the uh, African uh, Union uh, through uh, this uh, this uh, amount that was earmarked uh, by uh, uh, to uh, support to to Africa. And um, and for instance, we have been uh, uh, very. Um, uh, satisfied to be supporting the uh, multilateral, multilateral uh, task force in the Lake Chad region that has been, as you know, um, effective uh, in fighting uh, uh, terrorism in the region. I was myself in uh, uh, July uh, in Nigeria and I, I visited uh, um, the north uh, of uh, Nigeria. I was in uh, one of the camps uh, where we have, uh, where there are very uh, considerable hundreds of, uh, of uh, uh, former Boko Haram uh, fighters uh, that have um that are now uh, demobilizing and being reintegrated in the society. The European Union, uh, through this uh, support uh, to uh, Africa, has been, for instance, uh, supporting these uh, these efforts that that are, um, and we are seeing the the results of of also of these uh, of these efforts. So I think that there is um, that I understand the reasons for uh, concern. Uh, to to be honest, uh, I have not uh, uh, seen that the European. Union is not coming uh, in support to to Africa as much as we have been in the in the last years. As I told you before, uh, during this uh, senior officials meeting and also during the discussions that were held uh, during the Commission to Commission meeting. Um, in a working session devoted uh, to uh, peace and security and governance issues that was chaired by uh, the HRVP Borrell and Commissioner Bancole, there was of course a recognition that uh, that we need uh, that we have to to continue to make uh, to be more more coherent as um, as uh, it was uh, uh, it was said and that we need to be more more strategic and of course that we um, need to work better together, but uh, the I think that all the instruments for this cooperation exist, and there is uh, still a substantial financial support that can be used uh, to to support uh, the um, the requests by uh, our African partners. Over to you. Thank you so much, Rita, for this. I mean, let me move quickly to George to also share some of the, the insights on, around the funding and also where the conversation at the UN level um, is on this. Thank you so much. Um, maybe first, and, and, and this not specific, again, I want to take it global, not specific to Africa nor, nor the EU, because we partner a lot with, with the Union in, uh, in Africa. But I think the challenge that we see as a world is that financing is, is limited, right? And the, the gap to achieve the SDGs is growing and growing and growing because we, we tend to respond to the immediate crisis we see, the humanitarian crisis we see, which we have to, I mean, we have to save lives. But it, but it, that overarching attention to that and takes away from some of the underlying and longer term issues that have to do with development, which may not sound as sexy as keeping people alive, but in the end of the day are the essential tools for people to actually be able to thrive in their environments. And, and, and I think that's, that's one of the conundrums that we have. We know financing is limited um, and, and we have to find a way that we keep ourselves, our politicians, 
focused not on the next election and making sure that they can actually tell that that story to the to the population but what is beyond that right what is what is best for the for the countries that we serve so that's number one number two i think rita i wanted to pick up your point in um, on on nigeria you visit you mentioned we're doing a lot in stabilization and again it's 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 sometimes a misunderstood concept where stabilization equates to security um, and the conversation we're having that yes there's a security element in there because people would have to find a safe space to return to for example in some of those those areas but it's also about is there a school that my children can go to is there a clinic that i can be served for is there jobs that i can right so so it's a much broader conversation that we're having and for us what the what the difference is to some of the more traditional development work in stabilization is this very quick coming behind the authorities, so not seen as a UN flag or an EU flag or whatever country's flag, but coming behind the authorities to, to quickly turn into, uh, into these, these areas and to help re-establish life. So I think we need that broader conversation as well as about what, what do we mean when we say stabilization and, and how do we finance, finance that, that work. And then lastly, I think very concretely on the, um, your question on sort of the, the, the transitions we are working together within the UN system and the Africa Union on what we call the African Supporting Inclusive Transitions Facility. Um, the idea really being we've done a lot of research with the Africa Union and with our partners to try to better understand what drives those that research of, of coups and and and, um, and, and sort of, yeah, those unconstitutional changes of government. What is behind it? What can we do? Uh, and what can a regional body as the AU or regional economic commissions do in support of countries that either go through that phase and have to transition into a more democratic process or that actually, and I think you mentioned it, after the fact, how do we make sure that stability is actually not just a moment, but but actually allows them to uh, for for development to restart. Um, and so we're we're actively working with the AU on this. We're glad to see that it's recognized as a as a useful facility by the African Union. And we now need to work with our partners to try to actually source uh, some financing to this because we do feel that that's where the solutions are and can be. Um, and we have also recognized within the facility that it shouldn't be just about responding to those changes that we see but also very much a preventative element, working with countries where we see things may be happening and what is it that we can do to, to, yeah, to avoid that. Sorry, I stole your mic. Uh, thank you, Judge, for this. I think I will pick up on some of the issues raised because I want to tease out some of the reactions on them, you know, looking at, at the Ola who works on the continent as well as um, Paul Simon. You mentioned stabilization missions. And of course, this is a, a key way that, that the UN supports, but uh, there have been concerns about the effectiveness of the stabilization. And even to the extent that people are disheartened with it, resulting in, you know, sort of protests by, 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 by civilians on this, which is fueling some of the, 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 the crisis in some of the countries in West Africa. Paul Simon, I'd like you to comment on this, but also to comment on Rita's um, perspective about the, the, the European Peace Facility and support to the African uh, peace support missions and also other, you know, conflict prevention and all this are quite key. I have heard interlocutors comment about uh, the extent to which the EPF has already been used, let's be honest. The last I checked in October, about 3.1 had already been pledged to Ukraine. And this is a fund that is, has about 5 billion for uh, till now, till 20, 2000, um, 2027, much in the afternoon, 2027, 2027, yeah, I got it right. So let's be honest about it. The perception from the Africans on this is that, well, are we really guaranteed to have sustainable financing from the EU for our support missions? That's one. But also please comment on the, the, the effectiveness of stabilization missions and also how it relates to some of their um, purchase that we're seeing rising. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe let me start with stabilization. Um, um, and of course, I think uh, the way UNDP does stabilization is different from uh, UN peace support operations, uh, including stabilization. So we are talking about two two different um, things there. Um, let me maybe address the one, the peace support operations, because I think that's um, that's the, the the big talk of the day today. I mean, the UN is understand that something has to be done with 
peace support operations, uh, including a stabilization element. They are in crisis, clearly, um, because I think they've been trying to do too much um, at the same time um, and resulting in um, actually the fact that even the most important successes that have been uh, um, that have been made on the ground have been shadowed actually by the um, some of the mistakes or the failures and some of the failures are actually political because in the humanitarian and sometimes even the economic fields the un peace support operations stabilization operations have been actually quite successful actually um but in my view the failures are mostly political um the UN always say the stabilization mission had to go to the root causes of the of the crisis, but in reality, the UN becomes a resource in all countries. It is oh, no. deployed a resource that political actors use, misuse, and abuse. And uh, very often, the UN doesn't necessarily have the capacity to deal with the political issues on the ground. And I think that's a more systemic problem than um, than uh, the, the the stabilization concept of peace support operations is a complex one. In my view, the UN peace support operations should come back to fewer um, to to smaller mandates with fewer missions. So have to move away from the Christmas tree mandates um, and come back actually to basics. And also to be limited in time. A peace support operation cannot be lasting forever. It's neither good for the UN nor for the countries. So maybe let me um, address the issue of um, European support to African um, uh, peace operations or, or crisis. Um, I am I'm, I'm following with a bit of concern the fact that this discussion has been completely captured by financial term, uh, terms. It's only about money, money, money. Uh, African countries bring uh, uh, troops with boots on the ground and the European uh, Union should, should be funding. I think there are many more issues there. I'm not sure that uh, at all time, I think African organizations have made uh, um, a lot of efforts in the last 10 to 20 years in terms of uh, taking responsibility. We see it now also with the East African community uh, being deployed in the in the DRC, uh, in the eastern part of, of the DRC, although we're having, I mean, almost a traffic jam of initiatives in that region, but still, um, it's a good initiative. It's the first time a regional economic community is actually uh, taking initiative in that region of the Great Lakes and of, of the eastern part of the DRC. And yes, there are questions around the uh, the chain of command of that regional deployment. It's not just about money. It's about who takes the lead. Is it a similar deployment like Somalia, uh, like what AMISOM was, which for me was not a model, actually. Uh, in reality, I think the, this mission is actually reproducing some of the failures we've seen in Somalia. I hope the result will be different. But um, so for me, we shouldn't hijack the debate in financial terms, but rather also in having sustainable ways of uh, structuring this relationship that goes just beyond finance. Thank you. Thank you, Paul Simon. You've already started uh, the second phase of, of the, the questions, you know, looking for how can we then stem the tide? Because we've, we've been discussing, you know, issues around geopolitical transition, uh, structure problems that have really fueled our conflicts, but also rising authoritarianism. And you've already started, you know, giving us some pointers on how we can stem the tide. I have been informed that uh, Madame Rita will be leaving us shortly. So I would like to, you know, get her perspective or now that we've had these discussions about you know the challenges how can going forward how can um the, the, the european union african union african member states together with the un really harness um 
ways to work together to really stem some of the issues around uh, peace and security in, on the continent, the rising terrorism, cybersecurity, as well as, um, you know, just structural problems that, that, that exist that fuel this. Thank you. Well, uh, thank, you. Over to you. Yeah, thank you, and I'm sorry that I will have to leave. Um, well, I, I think that the, the instruments of the, the dialogue uh, exist, so I don't think that we yet, uh, you know, every time that we have to reinvent the wheel, we have, uh, you know, solid structures of, of dialogue among the European Union and the African Union, and uh, and the problems have been, uh, I think, are clearly identified. Uh, we know uh, where the difficulties lie and we know uh, what are the challenges uh, ahead. Of course, this is uh, all the time a moving uh, target and um, these days I'm always uh, recalling a professor I had in university that was always telling about uh, us and this was in the 80s, late 80s, early 90s about the um, increasing complexity of international relations and uh, indeed I think he was uh, very right that uh, the world is more and more complex but we do have uh, the uh, the instruments uh, to work uh, together among us and uh, and we have identified the, the critical areas I've uh, and I think that uh, from what uh, all the interventions in the room, indeed, I think that that we are sharing um, more or less the, the same uh, concerns. Uh, what we really uh, need to do is is to be more coherent, uh, more effective, and um, and to um, to find ways of of really uh, really uh, working uh, better uh, together. So uh, continue a, a strong uh, dialogue in in a spirit uh, which is the one that was uh, um, very much highlighted during the, the summit of, of a, a real uh, and equal uh, partnership in which we are um, open to to listen to the, the positions and the, of uh, of the other and uh, and to be able to to have a better better uh, common solutions to the problems. Thank you so much, Rita, for this intervention. And it's, um, you know, we're, we're sad to lose you um, um, as you have to leave. But I think the points that you've raised will really fuel the discussion also with the audience. And maybe I just, I, I want to open up to the Q&A session, but just one minute each from, from, from the panelists here, just to give us a way forward, you know, to strengthen the relationship. Already, um, you've mentioned um, issues around dialogue. And I want to bring Ola in here, because I think when it comes to governance, there have been also concerns about governance being one sided, one pointing to the other. So do you believe that there is actually opportunity for effective dialogue on issues around governance between the European Union and Africa? And what would this entail? Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Philomena. Um, I think in the end, it's not a question of whether there will be a dialogue. I think um, it, it is necessary to continue the dialogue. Um, um, that we've already started. Um, you know, to my mind, um, I think both on the African and European side, we often lose sight of the fact that, you know, despite all of the disagreements um, between, you know, in this intercontinental partnership, it's in many ways um, a partnership brought together by values. Um, and what do I mean by this? You know, it's very easy to look at some of the divisive issues around whether you know, African governments are sufficiently inclusive in, in now wanting to respect the rights of gay people um, and, and, and um, contentious issues of those sort. Um, but when it comes to, you know, a lot of the issues that bind both sides, the shared concerns, um, what Europe and Africa need to do together to create um, greater prosperity and uh, more stable societies um, and on, on both sides of the Mediterranean, um, I'm firmly of the opinion that we must bring value back in. Um, not necessarily those issues um, that have divided us, but a lot of the things I think we can meaningfully work around. Um, you know, if I'm asked to point to specific initiatives, um, I think um, there are serious, um, you know, um, misgivings on both sides, a, a huge um, trust gap that I think can be bridged. Um, and how do you do that? I, I started off um, um, by referring to some of the historical parallels that I see. I'm absolutely convinced that going forward, um, a more strategic engagement is necessary. But if you look at the way that this has worked throughout history, um, it's often involved um, 
you know, they're both partners, some um, have things they want to pursue together. And that those things exist, issues around um, better governance in Africa and Europe, concerns in Europe around migration, um, issues around um, security. Those are agendas that are there to work together with, um, including on climate change and the energy transition. How do you make this happen concretely? Whether you are talking about um, conflict management, you are talking about building stronger, stronger economies in Africa and Europe, I think you need some sort of um, deeper um, strategic understanding on both sides. Um, that what we need to work um, for are not things that are immediately beneficial, but things that would deliver, um, you know, in the longer term. So in that, in that, um, from that point of view, I would think that the most important message to deliver here in, in Brussels, um, I mean, Rita is no longer with us, but I think there is a lot of opportunity there for more a, a mindset of strategic benevolence on the side of the European Union, if you like. Um, there is distrust of the European Union in Africa. This is something that has come up again and again. But what can you do concretely to change that outlook? Issues around um, energy access. The way that the European Union comes to this at this time, a lot of players in Africa think there is not enough genuineness in it in wanting to pressure um, those wanting to access um, fossil fuel in Africa not be able to do that with finance, um, uh -huh. you know. So I, I think, you know, we must continue this idea of having the strategic dialogue, but also we can continue with those lower hanging fruits that I think in time will provide momentum to go forward together. Thank you so much, Ola. I think you really hit the nail on the head. The need to, to you know to, to really have this um, lo inward looking at the shared values, you know, that could really be a starting point for the conversation. Um, I started with George, so I'll, I'll first go to Paul Simon, just to give in really brief um, way you see forward in the partnership. What should be strengthened? What should be harnessed to make this a meaningful peace and security partnership, but also in the governance. Thank you. I think we're dealing here with partners who couldn't be more different. Uh, they are different stages of their development. So um, um, without saying that there's a junior and a senior partner here, but uh, uh, clearly, I mean, um, African countries have issues related, you know, um, we talked about the transitions here. We have a young population that did jobs, that did um, macrostructure that will stabilize them and uh, allow them to um, enjoy some sort of stability. So, um, and I think um, Holland van der Heer has said something quite interesting today, this morning, um, about how the dialogue is said to be a frank and open dialogue, but it's actually not. Um, it is uh, more posturing and positioning. We hear a lot about um, the various positions of the actors, but very little about the bridges uh, that could be built uh, between those uh, those diverging views because they, they, the views are divergent. So uh, a lot more should be invested in it, in building those bridges. Um, uh, Rita was alluding to the fact that there is um, a dialogue uh, there are structures, yes, there are formal structures of this dialogue where those positions are being expressed. But I think we also know that these, the way it's happening is very frustrating on both sides. And, uh, and I think the summit that happened earlier this year actually was uh, in a way also uh, was symbolizing this frustration shortly before the war in Ukraine came, came up. So building those bridges, it's easier said than done um, will be actually um, the, the the easy uh, low hanging fruit I'm, I'm <laughs> giving to policymakers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul Simon. Now I turn to George, sitting at the UN, you know, with the bird's eye view, looking at how the global affairs are, are developing, but also as an active actor, you know, because you you do partner with both 
the EU and, and, and the African Union on peace and security matters, where do you see bridges that can be built, opportunities to really strengthen this, including including Africa's agency at the UN, because this is an issue that was raised in Ezulwini has not been resolved till today. Yeah. And some of that I need a bigger bird to <laughs> to have that bird's eye view, specifically when it comes to the Security Council and, and the voices there of, of the African continent. Um, no, but I wanted to pick up on the, on the two points because I think this is, I was part of a, of a very difficult dialogue between actors in, in, in one country I served in a few years ago. And the mediator there was, was very clear in saying, one, let's start with the joint values, as what you were saying, Al. And then secondly, let's forbid each other to state our positions. Because when we state our positions, you're in that corner, I'm in that corner. And we're never going to get to the middle. It was very difficult to do because we tend to fall back to our position. This is my position. This is the position of the African continent. This is the position of the UN or of the EU. And by stating that so clearly, we are already creating not the bridge, but we're creating the divide. And and so the, the trick in that in those conversations, and it's not easy, but it's about understanding that a dialogue needs to be deliberate and that you actually need to prepare people for that dialogue. Right. And I think it's it's too often we forget that we can be either be too diplomatic and then we we skirt around the issue and we walk away and we all think we had a good meeting. Uh, or we state the positions and, and we're not advancing. Um and I think for us, it's really investing in the understanding of what it is that we're looking at and trying to build a common understanding. For example, now already we're talking with the AU on the elections that are coming in 2023. And, and what, is our, what is our joint understanding of what are we seeing on the ground? Hoping that with that, we can anticipate some of the challenges and we can each pull those levers where we need to, to, to help these countries through what unfortunately still is a very difficult period always in election, right? And it shouldn't be, it's not about the election, it's about actually effective governance, but somehow we're all concentrating on the election. But, but just that as an example that we want to be anticipating. So we are starting the conversation deliberately early based on what we understand, we see, listening to our partners, what they see, and then trying to create that common ground before it gets too hot and we're all just stating our positions. Thank you so much, George, for this. Joint values, I think it's, it's something that we can all agree on, maybe should be harnessed and really structured better during this multilateral forum. I would like to now open it up to the audience. Apologies, we began late, so we've gone a little bit over time. However, I'm sure you have burning questions that you'd like to ask our panel. So feel free to take the mic and ask this. Thank you. Please state your name before you ask a question. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Jean-Claude Boitin, a former EU official, and now I'm sitting on the board of ECDPM. I wanted to ask to, to the panel the question of the coverage of the African peace and security architecture. Yesterday, in the plenary, we were reminded that the competence of the AU Peace and Security Council is limited to looking at conflicts which are happening in Africa. And uh, we can see today how many conflicts happening outside Africa can have very serious impact on Africa, on Europe, or on both. It is not just about Ukraine. We could think of Yemen, we could think of Syria, we could think of the long-standing Middle East-Palestine process, which have an impact on both partners. So my question is, should we think or should we hope that the mandate of the AU PSC be, should be extended, enlarged, so that they could also look and take a view and assess conflicts which are happening outside Africa? And I'm wondering whether such a step, if it was ever made, would enrich the dialogue between the EU and the AU, because there would be more to talk about, not just conflicts in Africa, but conflicts also elsewhere, and whether it wouldn't be an important step for the AU when they claim to have a bigger role and a bigger voice on the multilateral scene. They would not only be bringing positions on AU conflicts, but on broader situations of conflict in the world. So that's a question to, to, the, to the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the audience? Yes, thank you so much. Very interesting panel. My name is Stephanie Arnold. I'm from, from the University of Bologna in Italy, and I'm a PhD researcher in digitalization in Sub-Saharan Africa. And my question was, um, so we heard about like um, increasing extremism. Um, we heard about like a young population. We heard a lot, a lot about like social tensions resulting from this like demographic change. 
and um, I was wondering about like the role of social media in in all of this because we know that like the urban youth like in Africa is very active on social media. Um, but what about content moderation to prevent like extremist attitudes? Like, is it a very high priority on on Africa's agenda? Is the is the EU like a go to partner um, in this uh, in this matter? Um, or is this really like um, a field where you feel like this is where African countries should be taking the responsibility as like uh, Ambassador Deere suggested yesterday? Thank you. Okay, one question over there. Sandra? Hello again, and um, a word of appreciation for this very rich and, uh, and, and very uh, pertinent uh, debate. Thank you for that. Um, I'm uh, currently working as a special advisor to the uh, Civilian Planning and Conduct Capability Deputy Managing Director, General Esteban, so I'll speak in that capacity now. Um, I'm a bit um, um, saddened by the fact that uh, the EU's crisis management tools are not being discussed in this forum, although I, I fully understand the AU-UN partnership, and that's really the driving force um, behind uh, stabilization missions in Africa. We fully respect that. But just to note that we do take an interest for the EU crisis management tools to be part of this uh, equation, and not because we want to push ourselves uh, around the table, but because we do have actually already crisis management missions uh, on the field, uh, in the field. So uh, not only civilian, but also military. So I do think that um, there is a scope for, for this, uh, you know, the, the trilateral relationship, but also maybe for the African Union uh, and, and uh, the UN, you're already, of course, doing it, but to consider civilian crisis management as a, a tool which could, uh, you know, uh, offer you a wide range of instruments that could come in handy in an early stage, of course, of the, of the conflict. So uh, we want to be a partner in that, and I think we, we offer a degree of quality, and for you to note that NATO, for example, is also taking an interest in it, because we are really spearheading these kind of, of, of operations. So. Um, uh, we, of course, come as a regional operator. We are the EU. We are not the UN. We are not global. So we will uh, automatically operate in countries where they, where they will need to be consent and not UN uh, Security Council resolution. So that's a very different uh, parameter. Um, I would like to pick up on what you said, George, I think it was on shared values. And from my experience in the field, actually, we do have quite a lot of leverage when it comes on shared values. It's such a, a low hanging fruit because it's an easy subject to talk about in, in a lot of cases, but it does uh, really, uh, you know, bring uh, people together in diplomatic terms and in, in, in peace and security uh, terms. So it shouldn't be uh, underestimated. Um, I wanted to also throw a question. Yes, okay. I know. Okay. I mean, I, I, I'm speaking a lot, but that's because I'm passionate about the subject, so please forgive me. Um, I would like to ask the panel, uh, do you think, because we are experimenting with this in terms of stabilization missions, do you think that a regional approach makes sense um, in that regard? Because we come in country by country, but then, of course, many lessons learned have already taught us that, you know, the crisis doesn't stop at the border, so there needs to be regional cooperation. But now we, what we are trying to do, um, you know, modestly, is uh, to come up with a regional approach, bringing missions in different countries together under a certain structure, etc. It's a very difficult question, but I would like to leave it with you anyway. Thanks, Philomena. Thank you so much, Sandra, for the, both the contribution and the questions. I think we're running behind time. I think they'll only allow me till half quarter past three, so let's try to respond timely to the panel who's willing to take up the questions. Yes, I'll, I'll take one or two and then I'm hoping the, the colleagues will join. Um, maybe first on the, the, uh, the last point, and I think, and thank you for mentioning. Um, for me, Mozambique is a good, Gabo de Galdo is a good example. Uh, we're yet to see, of course, the, the rollout, but, but it was one where all entities came together, all of the tools that are there are sort of planning together, looking together at, the, at sort of what is the scenario that we need to deal with. The EU also deployed uh, its development support uh, beyond sort of the civilian side of the mission, but also its development support, and it's all coordinated with, with the UN, AU. Um, and so I think that's a good example. And so thank you for raising that, and we need to see where we can do more than that. And I think it was what you also mentioned, it's not necessarily always about the money. It's about how we structure these things jointly and how do we make sure that it makes sense. So I really wanted to, to highlight that as a, as a good, good practice and I do hope it delivers because 
we all know it's needed in Mozambique. Um, and then the role of social media. I think one of, the, one of the things that we've seen, and for now it's still related to elections only, but we've rolled out in Africa, benefiting from the fact that social media is, I don't know, leaps advanced to what we see here even. Um, so we worked on this tool called iVerify, where we wanted to make sure this was around elections in Zambia, around elections in Kenya. Kenya has a long history of even sort of civil society coming in and, and dispelling some of the, uh, the negative messages and the hate speech that comes out. But that tool for us was important because it was beyond uh, social media. There's actually an infrastructure behind it of, of volunteers, of academics, who would actually look at what's being posted and not only counter the negative uh, just by saying this is not true or this is right, but actually by throwing up the narrative that, that we're all looking for in terms of what are, what are the real issues, right? What are the real policies of parties? What are the real... So I think we're, we're experimenting um, because we do recognize that it is a heavily, heavily polarized world and, and social media is just forcing all of us into those rabbit holes. Uh, and sort of countering that is, is definitely something on our agenda. Thank you so much, George. I would like uh, to give Ola and Paul Simon a chance, but really succinct. <laughs> no, um, what I just wanted to say is that um, on at least two of the questions asked, um, the one on regional approaches um, as something that brings some value add um, in crisis management, um, but also the question on the AU Peace and Security um, Council mandate. Um, these are issues that um, convinces me that um, I think the, the whole sort of wholesale movement within European policy thinking from a strategic approach towards more low hanging fruit because we're tired of what's not been achieved in the 12 years or so that the Joint Africa EU strategy has been operating, I think would be a real step back. When you have those more overarching sort of strategic level dialogues, they bring coherence across so many pro policy areas. And I think this is one of the ways in which the African side um, necessarily has to coordinate its position. But when you engage with um, interlocutors on a global scale internationally, as we do with the EU, um, those sort of strategic level dialogue forces you as a continent to come to common positions. And I think there is still some value add in having that strategic dialogue. Repeat your question for the uh, African Union Peace and Security Council. Um, yes, the mandate is uh, circumscribed on the African continent. It has to do with the history of the African peace and security architecture. And you look back how it was created, when it was cre created, the challenges then was actually for African countries to take responsibility about conflicts in Africa. But 20 years down the line, because the protocol, is, I mean, the AU is 20 years this year, 20 years down the line, indeed, I think might be time to look at the PSC as, as an actor that does not just look at crisis in Africa, because Africa is part of this world. The war in Ukraine is showing how two countries fighting a war somewhere, uh, and, and we feel the heat in Africa as well. So, um, uh, yes, I think it is time to uh, enlarge this mandate and uh, see the, P the, the PSC as a global uh, actor or as an African actor that looks at global uh, dynamics and, and development. Thank you so much, Paul Simon. If we have no questions online, Daniela, I could then wrap up and close. Yes. Okay. I want to thank everybody uh, who has been present, the, to the audience online who have stayed on. Apologize for the delay again, and thank you for for staying with us. To the panel, thank you so much. I think you really brought the discussion, really enriched some of the the, the ideas that we started out. As I began by saying that this was the the prison security partnership is seen as most effective, but as we have discussed today, there are also cracks in some that may seem from the outside to be working, not just geopolitical, but issues of finances, issues of transition issues around UN security reform and the need to really have structured dialogue, meaningful dialogue that really makes this partnership work for both Africa and for Europe. I thank you all for today. Have a lovely rest of the afternoon. <laughs>